Good afternoon. I'm Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's second fall seminar. We welcome the participants who are joining us online through Zoom, as well as the participants who are here with us at the live presentation at the University of Kentucky. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions this afternoon. We welcome questions from all our participants. Please type your questions in the chat box or use your microphone if you are on if you are online. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. Please take a brief moment at the conclusion of the seminar to complete our evaluation. The evaluation will be sent to your email address immediately after the seminar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming seminars. Now to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Deb Castiglione is the Universal Design and Instructional Technology Specialist in the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Castiglione has over 20 years of professional experience educating individuals of all ages, both with and without disabilities. Dr. Melinda Jones Alt is an associate professor in the Department of Early Childhood Special Education and Rehabilitation Counseling. Dr. Alt has worked with learners with disabilities for over 30 years. She has taught classes in universal design for learning to both general and special education majors. The title of the seminar is Beyond Curb Cuts, Universal Design for Learning. I'm now going to turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Walt. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. And I'm actually, oh, there we go. Okay. We're going to skip the first slide. We were going to do introductions, but we thought it might be a little unwieldy with everyone that has signed up. Um, so we're just going to start by reviewing the learning objectives. Um, in case you did not see them in the flyer. First, you're gonna recognize the importance of universal design for learning and addressing <coughs> diversity. You will express how UDL can meet the needs of individual learners. You identify strategies to remove barriers to learning for all learners. And you identify ideas for incorporating UDL into the development and implementation of instruction to make it more inclusionary. So we are going to begin with a video called Meet the Normals. Meet the Normals, Adventures in Universal Design. Exterior of a house on a sunny day, the normals are outside. Meet Harry Normal. Harry is the father of the family. He is a stay-at-home dad. Meet Mary Normal. Mary is the mother of the family. She is a manager in the local supermarket. Meet PJ Normal. PJ is the baby of the family. Meet Betty Normal. Betty is the granny of the Normal family. She has arthritis and has lately experienced mild hearing and vision loss. But she is very active and uses a cane to get around. She loves to play the Wii regularly with her grandkids. Meet Susie Normal. Susie is 18 years old. She is going to college. She is rarely seen without her iPod and guitar. Meet Johnny Normal. Johnny is 10 years old, uses a wheelchair, and loves history and music. Family enter the house. Today will be a treat, as Betty is bringing the family for a pizza. First, we need to get the bus. So let's check the bus times. Parents are using the family PC. Oh dear. This seems to be very complicated. Susie uses her smartphone with simple layout instead. Now we've got it. Let's go. For many of us, we never think twice about how we use technology, travel, move in and out of buildings, or use the web. But really, when you think about it, we all often encounter problems doing these things. Family at bus stop. And accept this as a part of life. Consider what it is like for the normals getting on the bus and their experiences. Firstly, let's look at the bus shelter location. Are things in the way? Is the bus shelter big enough? Simple things like seating. Access to information when you need it in a way that makes sense. There are other environmental factors, such as light, noise and so on. Bus arrives. And the design of the bus itself. 
Betty and Susie get on. Dad tries to get Baby's Bobby up step onto Buzz but fails. Buzz driver asks for fare. Flustered mom drops her purse. Buzz departs, leaving Betty, PJ and Johnny behind. <coughs> a design studio in a different part of town. Thanks to good universal design, it doesn't have to be like this. In order to build a working shelter that suits the needs of everyone, we need the right team. So, let's meet the team. First off, I'd like you to meet Siobhan. She is a software developer. Dara, our civil engineer. Rory is our architect. And Paul, our industrial designer. Normals and designers around a table. Creating the easy to use, universally designed bus shelter is a collaborative and fun process. Right guys? Always. Let's see how you do it. Firstly, we have the discover phase where all the designers keep an open mind, deferring any decision-making until they have considered a range of alternatives and approaches to the design. They need to have collected as much information as feasible, including new or existing feedback from people. They need to look at the project from the perspective of the end users. So who are the end users and what do they need? Well, a great way to find out is to involve the end user in the process through things such as focus groups, where we ask them what they think. Then we have the definition phase, where the designers must decide what they want the design to do. To help achieve this, they must keep in mind the range of people that will be using the design, outputs from the discover phase, and consider what they want the design to do. Then we have the development phase, where the designers look at actualizing the needs they have identified in the previous stage. This stage typically includes the development of simple preliminary designs and asking people what they think. Lastly, we have the delivery phase, where the designers see if it all works. They may get experts to look at their final designs. Another great way to test the design is through user testing of prototypes, where we test early versions of our products on users with a diverse range of abilities to see what works. If something doesn't work, the designers can go back to an earlier phase and try again. The universal design process, with the four phases. Discover, define, develop, deliver. Now we have applied the universal design process to designing the bus shelter, Let's go back and see what happens this time. Family approach new bus shelter. Dad with PJ in a buggy and Johnny in a wheelchair now have an unobstructed path to the bus shelter. Bus shelter is tall enough to accommodate Mary's tall stature. Seating is low enough to accommodate Granny. Bus timetable and fare information is simple and understandable. Starts to rain, bus shelter is large enough to shelter the entire family. Bus arrives. Bus kneels, allowing level entry access to all the family. Thanks to universal design, the normals can go about their day in a world that accommodates us all. Mum has fair ready and pace without any fuss. Family waves and bus pulls away. Universal design is the design of a building or place, product, service or technology so they can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability or disability. Created by the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority, in partnership with Dublin Institute of Technology, NUI Maynooth, Cork IT, Dundalk IT, National Learning Network. As you can see, diversity is the new normal. Um, and I wanted to start with that video because basically universal design for learning has its foundations in universal design. Um, it comes to us from the field of architecture. There's a gentleman named Ron Mace who coined the term universal design. And basically it's designing all environments, products and services or technology so they can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by everyone. And that is regardless of age, size, ability, disability, or any other characteristics that somebody might bring to the table. And that is, if I can hit the right button here, okay, without the need for adaptation or specialized design. 
So according to MACE, what we need to do is consider everyone's needs from the very beginning, consider the widest range of needs possible and bring that in from the beginning, bring that into the design of the technology, of the product, of the environment, whatever it is. Oops. All right, so here's a picture of universally designed set of stairs. And as you can see, some things actually give individuals choices. So if you do not have a disability, you have the choice of walking up or down the stairs or using the ramp. If you have a disability, you get to use the same set of stairs essentially as somebody else, but instead you're using the ramp. The other thing when incorporating it in from the very beginning is it's more aesthetically pleasing. So as you see in the next slide, we've got that same set of stairs. It's much more aesthetically pleasing than the set or the ramp on the right-hand side, which has been retrofit or built after the fact to enable somebody to use that exit. And as you can see, it's just not very nice looking. It doesn't look even very durable or sturdy at the same time. Another example of universal design is um, a solution that works for everyone. It's the sensor doors. So no matter who it is that comes up to the doorway, the doorway will open and let you in. So if we were coming in carrying a stack of books, we would not have to worry about trying to open the door. If an individual was in a wheelchair, the door would automatically open for them. Um, can anybody think of any other examples that would be solutions that would work for everyone? Yes. The idea of the steps earlier to, you showed, um, I, I thought it looked pretty cool because, well, someone in a wheelchair that you're walking with, mm -hmm. you're, you're walking along with them, they have to take a, sep a separate route. And so the conversation has to pause. You don't get to walk up the stairs with them. So maybe a wide walkway or these type of stairs. That's a very good point. You could actually walk and continue a conversation with someone that was in a wheelchair. Yeah, I have to walk, follow a single file either. So if I'm walking in front of them, they're not looking right at my lower back. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I'm just wondering if you could repeat the question or the comment for the people online. Okay. To make sure they heard. I wasn't sure if I needed to or not. Okay. Well, basically, the, the comment was that you could, um, that set of stairs that I showed earlier was nice because you could walk side by side with someone and continue a conversation instead of an individual having to take a separate path to get to the end of where you were, where you were going. Um, some other things to think about is, is was in the video, the kneeling buses, which I didn't realize that they were actually called kneeling buses, but it could be used by everybody. It could be used by someone that was on crutches someone that was in a wheelchair, someone that's got their bike and they're gonna be taking the bus. I actually saw one the other day that somebody got off of that was taking their rolling suitcase with them and the bus kneeled down so they were on the level plane with the sidewalk. Another is the common example that most people use, the curb cut, which was originally designed for people in wheelchairs and how many different people make use of the curb cut today um, people use it when they are taking their children for a walk in strollers. We see them at shopping centers for shopping carts. Um, people that are on bikes or rollerblading or whatever, they can use the curb cut instead of having to go over the curb. So it benefits a lot more people than the people that it was originally designed to benefit. One now is voice control that people use now all the time with their phone, you know, when they talk to Siri or, uh, speech to text when you're texting people. I know that I do that a lot, so. And that was actually the next good oh. segue into the next okay. slide, which was talking about those types of products that are universally designed, like captioning. Captioning used to not be available, and now you find it's available on TVs. We're using captioning for for like news stations. You can watch the news, the news somewhere where there's, there's um, a lot of noise in the background. Other things like, the, like Siri or OK Google, um, that you can actually do the speech to text, uh, motion sensor lighting, um, speaker phones, all kinds of things are being universally designed. Yeah, and th this is just a you know, cute little cartoon that points out here's you've got the custodian and all the people are trying to get into the building and the custodian is shoveling the snow and um, the, the person in the wheelchair says, can you please shovel the ramp? And 
uh, the custodian says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And they say, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So really thinking about uh, what makes what makes things learning and architecture accessible for everyone, regardless of what they come to the table with. And speaking of learning, what have we assumed about learners to date? What do we assume about learning in general? I'm going to show you um, a couple of clips from a, a TED talk by a gentleman named Todd Rose that it's entitled The Myth of Average. And I have to find the cursor. Mm -hmm. I'm not used to a PC, so you have to be patient with me. Let's suppose that you're writing a really important email to a colleague. Okay, where's the thing? I know I can't get it to come over there. Or a post on Facebook that all your friends will see. All right, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here. Does it have captions? Yes. 1952, and the Air Force has a problem. They've got good pilots flying better planes, but they're getting worse results, and they don't know why. And for a while, they blame the pilots, they even blame the technology, and they eventually got around to blaming the flight instructors. But it turned out that the problem was actually with the cockpit. Let me explain. Imagine you're a fighter pilot. You're operating a machine that, in some cases, can travel faster than the speed of sound, and where issues between success and failure, sometimes life and death, can be measured in split seconds. If you're a fighter pilot, you know that your performance depends fundamentally on the fit between you and your cockpit. Because after all, what good is the best technology in the world if you can't reach the critical instruments when you need them the most. But this presents a challenge for the Air Force, because obviously, pilots are not the same size. So the issue is, how do you design one cockpit that can fit the most individuals? For a long time, it was assumed that you could do this by designing for the average pilot. That almost seems intuitively right. If you design something that fit for the average sized person, wouldn't it fit most people? It seems right, but it's actually wrong. And 60 years ago, an Air Force researcher, Gilbert Daniels, proved to the world just how wrong this really is and what it was costing us. Here's how he did it. He studied over 4,000 pilots, and he measured them on 10 dimensions of size. And he asked a very simple question. How many of these pilots are average on all 10 dimensions? <laughs> the assumption was that most of them would be. Do you know how many really were? Zero. Gilbert Daniels proved there was no such thing as an average pilot. Okay, so basically there is no such thing as an average pilot. Um, what, they, what they ended up doing was designing things differently so it would be um, able to fit different kinds of pilots. So putting adaptations into the cockpit so they could be adjusted to fit everybody's needs since there was no average and that expended the pilot pool substantially. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here and play a second part of this video for you. 